Well, welcome back to another wacky world of coins. Today, courtesy of PCGS and Great Collections, we have another familiar coin that had sold a few weeks ago. As a matter of fact, July 24th was the date of the sale of yet another 1983 Lincoln cent that was struck on what we call a bronze or copper planchet. All right, so in case you guys forget, let me go ahead and kind of tell you a little bit about the story first. The U.S. Mint, in a kind of a way of cutting costs, had decided to go from its uh, pre-existing, it, they call it bronze, but it's like 98% copper, 2% tin. So the combination alloy, you know, is bronze uh, to them. And it is. <laughs> Uh, so, in the spirit of trying to cut costs, and even to this day, we're still struggling with it. Not so much we as in the people, but the mint. You know, everything is just getting so gosh darn expensive. In 1982, they had transi transitioned over from the outgoing copper bronze composition to what we know as the copper coated zincan. That's right, the very coin that we love to hate because the things just crumble right in our hands. So 1982 was kind of a benchmark year. We had uh, both compositions still being used. They made large dates. They made small dates in both Philadelphia and in Denver Mints. So you get the big idea. It was kind of a strange year. Now, crossing over to 1983, the first full year in which all the coins produced during this time is supposed to be this copper-coated zinc alloy. And the things weigh next to nothing, all right? So, an uh, outgoing bronze composition is right around three, well, it's supposed to be 3.11 grams, whereas the zincan is around two and a half grams. So, pretty, you know... It, in terms of grams, sometimes it might be hard to differentiate what the weight feels like in your hand between 2.5 grams and 3.11. But it's actually quite distinguishable. You hold both coins in your hand. One feels a lot heavier than the other. So, after so many years of production, um, there have been a few examples of what we like to call the transitional error. And uh, again, this affects... Any sort of like two-year kind of range of coinage where the mint goes from composition A, okay, we're going to use another uh, example here in a second, to composition B, okay? Another great time of period in which this occurred was 1964 to 1965. 1964, 90% silver ran rampant across our Roosevelt dimes, our quarters, Half dollars, and that's the way it was. 1965, again, as a cost-cutting measure, silver just became way too expensive to use in modern circulating coinage, that they went with a copper-nickel clad. So it's a transitional year. So there are these transitional errors, and it's real simple, okay? Okay. The first full date of the new composition was struck by the older, uh, on older uh, planchets with the older composition, okay? Pretty pretty easy to kind of figure out here. And um, how does this happen? Well, it's probably as simple as, you know, mint employees uh, sitting there sweeping up, you know, um, the floor of the U.S. Mint. You know, they come across, a, you know, a bunch of stuff. They come across... Old planchets from 10 years ago, they'll throw that back in the mix. You know, it really doesn't matter, okay? It's just these bronze planchets end up back into the group of copper-coated zincan type composition planchets, and then they, in turn, get struck, and they get sent out into circulation. Now, the cool thing is, is that they're hard to look for. Unless you have a scale or you're really good at the ping test, just dropping it right on the table. You know, the two different compositions give off a varying type of sound when it hits the table. Okay. Uh, of course, the safest way you want to do is just simply weigh it. All right. Make sure that your, uh, your scale weighs 
in, um, was it tenths or hundreds? One of the two. But it's got to read exactly 3.11 on there and not, you know, uh, and not to the uh, the nearest whole number or whatever it is, which some skills do. So you got to be careful. But um, the graders have always specified that these coins were struck on so-and-so planchet pre-1983. Copper, you know, and they'll, you actually use the abbreviation of based off of what they see on the periodic table of elements. Uh, was it CU for copper or something like that? And they'll put that on the slab label. Now, there was a recent sale on Great Collections. Again, July 24th. This is uh, not even two weeks ago. Yeah, not even two weeks ago. I mean, we're, what, nine, nine, ten days from this sale? Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and throw it on screen here. So this is what sold. PCGS has thrown us another weird, funky... I don't know what this is, all right? But they said it struck on substandard pre-1983 one-cent planchet. This particular coin ends up weighing 2.92 grams, slightly underweight, but still fine. But why couldn't they just stick with the same same thing and just say that it was struck on a pre-1983 copper planchet? What's with, what's with this struck on substandard, blah, blah, blah? They, I mean, they might have their reason, but... It's it's it can be very confusing. All right, it could be. You know, is considering that the transitional errors uh, in the hobby are worth a lot of money, thousands of dollars in most occasions. This particular coin that sold on Great Collections ended after buyer's premium at three thousand ninety three dollars and seventy five cents. Now the coin is a PCGS AU fifty eight. Okay, which denotes that there has been some circulation wear, and it shows every bit of that on the coin. You can see the actual blow up of the actual obverse of the coin to the right of the slab on that image I showed you. But again, that this just so there's some clarification really means the same thing as it always has. It's a transitional error strike in which the 1983 dated coin was struck on the older outgoing composition and it's not supposed to be that way um so there were a number of these that were produced in error okay there's probably a good dozen or so that exist today and the prices have been all over the place they've been as high as ten fifteen thousand dollars and of course you have examples like the one on great collections that ended up mustering thirty one hundred dollars give or take so um when you go to grade these things, if you're a lucky recipient of one, and again, it's going to be a matter of just looking for them. Um, they, they've been found in dates as recent as 1989, 1990. All right. That, that's, that's how new some of these transitional strikes have occurred within the Lincoln Sun series. So when you go to send these out, make sure that you put struck on substandard blah 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 and um yeah i guess that's the new terminology that we're using on transitional strikes now are they going to do the same thing on silver to copper nickel errors you know that kind of like like finding a 1965 quarter that was struck on a substandard pre-1965 uh planchet i don't know it could possibly be that way um, I thought about it and I, I was thinking, I'm like, did they use substandard because it was underweight? Because that wouldn't make any sense. They put the weight on there. So there, there wouldn't be any clear reason why you should put substandard on the label. It just doesn't make any sense, but that's a really good way to confuse people. And, um, is it because of this new terminology that we've seen this particular coin probably undersell compared to what the market would call for it. I don't know. You know, it might very well be $3,000 is the right call on this one, but it just seems cheap to me, uh, considering that the market is still strong for not only errors and varieties, but all coins in general, a lot of the older, uh, older type coinage, uh, seeing still strong secondary market sales and then unique, errors like this 
that only show up once in the blue moon, all right, are always strong performers on the secondary market. So, uh, yeah, kind of an interesting deal. I uh, wanted to let you guys know that, that this is the new labeling for the transitional coppers um, that you guys need to know about. Um, because if you do find one on the open market and nobody is hip to the fact that they've changed to substandard um, on the label, you might be able to pick one up really cheap and then take advantage of it uh, uh, as a resale or you could add it to your collection, you know, things of that nature. But yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, I don't know what else to say about it uh, other than, uh, again, it's a, another um, point in which maybe it's an unneeded change, if anything. Um, it, it's like kind of like rewriting the whole uh, um, uh, grading scale. You know, what if they went from one to a hundred, you know, just uh, out of the blue or like, oh, we're going to do this, you know, to be more completionistic about it. It's, it's like, it's rewriting the rules and, uh, you know, numismatics, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that are not going to like it. This is in a way rather minor, but, you know, considering that it is a very, very valuable coin, there are some people that probably would care, uh, that that is what is written on the PCGS label. Anyways, I digress as usual. Uh, that's why I wanted to talk about, yeah, these things are still being found out there. Weigh your coins. If you feel like that you have a transition, and people are always trying to look for these transitional errors, I get comments all the time on them. It's all about weighing the coins. Don't do the ping test because it can be unreliable, especially if the coin has gunk and varnish and all sorts of other crap on there. It's really going to distort your view of the coin and what you have. Uh, always weigh the thing. All right, uh, use discretion. Uh, the scale can be had for under 10 bucks for crying out loud. Uh, always pick out a good one that that reads uh, on a very deeper, uh, I, I guess, um, decimal point uh, rather than just tens. But yeah, it's pretty cool. I want to find one of these for myself so that way I can take my family to Disneyland because apparently that's what it's going to take. Have you seen Disneyland tickets? Oh. Might I say more, right? All right. Guys, take care. Have a good one.